Good evening, everyone. I'm glad that you are here. I'm Jimmy. What a beautiful day it is. It's first full day of spring, I think. And uh, here we are in northern Missouri going through about another week and a half, maybe two weeks of crazy roller coaster all the way down to cold and chilly temperatures. But that's the way of things, isn't it? First of all, if you would, give a thumbs up. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, I invite you to do so. But I'm simply glad that you are here and joining in this evening in the chat. I will show up in the chat as Last Day's Awakening. That's the title of the channel. So that's kind of how it will show up in the chat. But that's me. Moi. Yo. That's me. So welcome and, and feel free to chat and uh, let us know where you're from again. Um, just to show up in the chat, basically, hey, I'm from Australia, wherever you're from, and we have them from all over the place. It's uh, It's been an interesting few days, hasn't it? We have seen all kinds of things coming through the news, and this whole April 8th eclipse is picking up steam. I don't know if you have noticed, but um, they're claiming many things, and several of those states and municipalities along the uh, the the path of totality of the eclipse that will happen on April 8th are asking their citizens, informing their citizens they need to stock up on food, they need to uh, be prepared for some outages, possible outages, uh, the lack of cell service, and, and of course what they're blaming that on is the numbers of people that are supposed to be visiting that, that path of totality. Now, Having been where we are in St. Joseph, Missouri, in the 2017 eclipse, there's a lot of truth to that. The numbers of people that were around here were incredible. Uh, I was actually working out on our kids' house. We were building their home uh, on a little homestead area that they had purchased, and so uh, we had just finished up the decking of the of the floor, the first floor. And we're starting to raise walls when that eclipse took place. It was cloudy as can be, uh, but you could just kind of see the eclipse happening through the clouds, and then it got a little bit dark. But the people were lined up. I mean, it was incredible. So I'm sure that's going to happen again on April 8th. But I think it's um, it's rather interesting that um, all of this is starting to flurry around the uh, eclipse that is coming up on April 8th. Now, about that eclipse, it's easy, and, and I do I personally believe it is a sign to the United States of America. How big a sign is it? I don't know. I believe the 2017 eclipse was a sign. And it was stated, of course, that that eclipse went through seven towns, cities, or municipalities named Salem. Of course, Salem means peace, and that's directly related to Jerusalem, the, the city of peace. And, uh, but if you, if you do a deeper dive, this is where we can kind of miss some things or we can, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to be offensive or countering anything, but quite technically in the path of totality in the 2017 eclipse, and I've gone over this and kept, where are they figuring there were seven? There were only five cities in the path of totality that were named Salem. Uh, two of those cities were not, one of those cities was not in the actual path of totality. It was in the shadow. It was, it was in the penumbral shadow, okay? It wasn't in the umbral. It wasn't in the path of totality. And one of the municipalities that were given it actually no longer exists. So there were only seven. And I got to thinking, okay, seven, does that mess it up? And, and actually, it doesn't mess it up, and this is a, just my opinion, but five is the number for grace, is it not? It's the number of grace in the scripture. And if it really technically only went through five cities in that total, in that total eclipse area, the path of totality, it only went through five cities, then, then we're not talking about the seven being the number of completion, we're talking about the Five being the number of grace. And was that, my friend, the last warning of grace 
for the United States of America, knowing that not quite seven years ahead would be another eclipse that would be a, uh, a, a total eclipse across the bulk of the United States of America with a path of totality that would actually go through seven cities called Nineveh. So you have a five, five of Salem. I know they keep saying seven, but bear with me here. It's, it's actually five. And five being the number of grace, you had a warning that grace is going to now be somewhat... Uh, Boy, you know, God's grace is wonderful. I'm not, I'm not talking about God's grace for salvation. For America, the grace period may be started and would be extended until the 2024 eclipse, and then the signal would be Nineveh. Mm. Seven cities named Nineveh across the United States of America. Seven cities, towns, municipalities. All right. Some of those are not in the path of totality either. They're in the shadow. So how far do you take this? This is why we have to be careful and not get into a feeding frenzy. But uh, rather look up understanding that God is speaking and that for us this would be a point of pondering, of wondering, but also great joy because we already have Jesus Christ and we're looking up and anticipating and longing for the blessed hope. Some aren't going to believe that. Some are going to believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. That's fine. I just believe in Jesus Christ. We're going to find out. We're going to see what we're going to see. All right? So that was just on my mind. That was a thought on my mind. Secondly, we've been discussing a little bit of the calendars. I'm not going to do that so much tonight. But just, just the thought, we have, we have passed through uh, two, if not three calendar dates. The, the Torah calendar has Nisan 1 or had Nisan 1 on, on March 11th. So the start of the calendar was March 11th. So if the rapture was going to happen before Nisan 1 and the start of the new year, all right, 5784 uh, uh, 57, or 5994, counting the 210 extra years that are missing, uh, either way, that first Torah calendar, didn't. we didn't see anything happen as far as the Nisan 1. Now, I don't believe that's the correct calendar, but that's okay. Then we have the Enoch calendar that Repo Man 64 uh, has been looking, on, looking at. Well, that day passed. Does it mean it's not true? No, it just simply means that, that day passed. And if that is the correct calendar, then we're, we're beyond Nisan 1. We're beyond a B1. So we would be looking at some further date, future, um, you know, coming up, whether that would be, uh, well, really the only thing left at this point is coming up onto the Passover season, the raising of Lazarus, uh, the uh, triumphal entry, which would be Nisan 10, of course, the day of the choosing of the Lamb, all the way up to Passover, and then resurrection, so so on and so forth. Well, that uh, Nissan one's gone, and and today is actually Nissan one of the the scene calendar uh, that looks at Enoch's calendar, but chooses to name. I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, the equinox, not the equilux, but the equinox as being uh, the day after the equinox. Equinox being the first day of the year. Okay, that's today. That's today. So nothing has happened today. Could happen today. I'm listening for a trumpet sound. I'm looks, listening for it all the time. My ear is tuned to the pitch of the trumpet and the voice. See, because his sheep know his voice, right? I, I'm waiting for that, that shout that got to come from the mouth of the Lord. Hey, you guys, come up here. However it is, I don't know. So we have these things to look forward to, don't we? Um, then, of course, the next date that we're that that would be there would be the next calendar, of course, which is the Hebrew calendar, showing that April 9th is day one or Nisan one. So the new new moon being sighted, a probable sighting being on the evening of April eighth, 
roughly about the time when the eclipse is crossing the United States of America. How interesting is that? And then April 9th being the first day, 9th into the 10th being the first day. So don't get confused. We're six hours behind, six or seven hours behind with our time change. Weird, weird, weird. So that's still coming, which also puts on that calendar Purim. Purim. By the way, that's how, that is how it's pronounced. I know it's hard to not say Purim, but it's Purim. Doesn't matter. Uh, just a note. Um, Purim is coming up on the 24th, in 23rd, 24th, 25th, a two-day, three-day period of time. And so we would still be looking at that. What's right? You know what? At this point, I don't know. Uh, it's not that I'm trying to be wishy-washy. We're in the season, guys. Phew! We're in a block of time. Uh, I think the May date puts it way too far out there. Reason being, if you if you don't start the calendar until May and you count forward to the seventh month, then you're looking at uh, Yom Teruah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, and you're looking at Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot being in December. That pushes Hanukkah out to January. Uh, technically, this is just, just too far out there. We're in the season. Can the Lord delay it? Yes, he can delay it. It's his deal. It's not my deal. We're just simply looking and, and waiting. What I want to uh, present this evening is actually a portion, a good portion of the message that I preached at Freedom Church here in St. Joseph on Sunday, talking about the spiritual war. And I, I dig into why we're seeing such a uh, inc an incredible increase in the spiritual activity and why I believe it's so. Um, and I explained this in the message, and I believe it's pertinent. I believe the fact that we're in a war and the war is intensifying, and no matter how much time we have left, whether that's from now until April 8th or beyond, I don't know. It's going to intensify, but we take joy in the fact that we have Jesus Christ. He has told us, He's given us in His Word what this would all look like. And then through the Apostle Paul, he has, the Spirit of God has demonstrated that we are in spiritual battle and we need to have the full armor of God. I'm not going to talk about the armor of God in this message. That's actually for this coming Sunday. But uh, I want you to listen in to this. And if you would hold tight, uh, go through this sermon. And uh, I will end the sermon like I always do our, our video. It's actually on uh, Philippians 4.13, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So um, buckle in here, uh, get ready for the word. We had a couple little technological mishaps as far as how I could use my remote to get the words up on the screen because I forgot to plug the thing in, but that's okay. We'll work through it. You'll kind of see the banter between me and the congregation that I have because it's very personable. Uh, we're we're there in person. This is just not a lecture. This is a discussing and preaching of the Word of God. So uh, buckle in. Let's talk about the war. We're going to go to the Scripture. <clears throat> we're going to talk about, this is part two in our signs of spiritual war. We looked last week at the war. The war kind of has many facets. It started, by the way, at creation. It's still ongoing. The war didn't stop just because Jesus died on the cross. And many have that idea. The war stopped. You know, we won the victory. Jesus won the victory. Jesus won the victory that is to come. Jesus still has yet to crush the head of the seed of the enemy. Oh, he's crushed the devil's head. No, he hasn't. That day is yet to come when he will crush the head of the seed of the enemy. He's known as the other Christ. All right? And at the end of that, when that's all said and done, when it's all completed, and I'm not going to get into all that timeline because it's, it's long, it's, it's not complicated, it's just there's a lot there. In the end, it's not going to be the crushing of the devil's head that we're going to see. It's going to be the, de the devil himself being picked up and, I, I like to say drop-kicked, because I I, there's no, no better terminology. He is going to be drop-kicked right straight into the lake of fire. 
But for us, the victory is won in Jesus Christ. But the battle rages. We've got to remember that. We have victory now, but that doesn't mean we don't have the battle and we don't see uh, even the sense of casualty in our own life because we all do. We've all, we're, we're walking through a world right now that is filled with casualties and many of those casualties spill over right into our own life because we're in the world. We're not of the world. Amen. We've been brought out of it, but we're still here. So how in the world does that work? We're, we're now the illegal, <laughs> gotta be careful here. The illegal aliens of the world are you. I'm not talking about anything about the migrant situation right now. I'm talking about the illegal aliens, strangers and sojourners in this land. That's us. We have been made strangers and sojourners because we have turned to follow Jesus Christ. So stop being comfortable with the world because any, anyone who loves the world, this is from 1 John, anyone who loves the world uh, you know, the, anyone who loves the world does not have the love of God in them. So if, you, if you're loving the world right now, man, how can you love the world right now? How can you? Except to express Jesus Christ in the world. We love the world because God so loved the world that he sent Jesus Christ. But it, we don't love the way of the world. We love the people because they need Jesus. And the only way that they're going to see Jesus is if we Instead of being reactive to everything, if, if we reach out in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we accept everything. We don't. We don't accept the garbage. You don't accept the garbage. You don't bring the garbage into your own house. But you speak the truth to what the garbage is. You speak the truth to the people in the garbage, showing them the same love that God showed you. And we'll see what God does through that. Amen? That's what it means to love the world. But not love the world right? We're kind of uh, in a situation where if you're walking along and you're heading, it's kind of, kind of like us going up to the garden. We go up to our garden and, um, and let's just say there's good stuff happening up there in the garden. It's growing. It's not. It's too early, but there's stuff growing in the garden, but it's been rainy. Well, to get to the garden, you got to go through mud. The mud's not the garden. The mud's before the garden. When you go to the garden, you head into the garden, you get mud splashed on you. So what do you need? You need a good foot washing. I'm not washing your feet. All right, that's not the point. The point is, when Jesus looked at his disciples and Peter said, no, wash all of me. He said, dude, you're already clean. You're clean, except your feet. Why? Because your feet's walking through the world. That's the, 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 the metaphor of us walking through the world. We get splashed on. But you know what? Just, just what the word that came that Adrian brought is we come to the Father. We come to the Lord all the time and say, as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not a salvation prayer. That's a cleanup prayer. That's a daily cleaning. That's a, that's a daily shower. You come to the Lord and say, Lord, man, I, I fouled that up. I now know I fouled that up. That was a real moronic thing to do. It was stupid. It was dumb. It was, or I did something that was really, I know, was against uh, the, the flow of the Holy Spirit in my life. Forgive me. What's he do? <sharp inhale> Cleanse me. Strengthen me. He does it. Amen? Amen. All right. That's the mini sermon of the day. Let's get into the big, the big one, because this, that's just the picture of the spiritual war in an overall sense. Here's what the scripture says. I think we've got three slides on this, but here's what it says, and, and, and read it out loud with me. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. Say that, say it. Wiles. Now say it with a Texas accent. Wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle with against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Boom! I was... Now, that's scriptural. That's in the scripture. 
<laughs> I mean, there's just a point you got to look at something and say, boom, there's the point. War. War. Never forget it. You're in a war. Oh, I didn't want to be in a war. Tough. Tough. You're in a war. We all know it. Part one, we walked through that whole list of of signs of where the war is happening, how the enemy is attacking. But today we're going to look at it in, in a sense, number one, that it's intensifying and there's a reason for the intensity. There's a reason for it. We're going to get to that reason. So I want you to understand, and, you, and I think we all acknowledge it. You know, raise your hand and wave if, if this is true. It's intensifying. Okay, so when it's intensifying in the world, that means the spiritual battle that hovers and flows and circulates around you is intensifying. Oh, that does not sound so good, Pastor Jimmy. Right? No, well, it's, it's not good in the sense that spiritual war is increasing. Oh, I just want to live a peaceful life. Sweetheart, you're following Jesus Christ. Your peaceful life is only in Him. Don't call me sweetheart. Surely. Surely. It's spiritual war. It's your spiritual battle. You sense it. You sense it almost from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, and you certainly sense it while you're sleeping. How many have had more disturbed sleep lately, where it's harder to sleep? Unless you're just so dead tired, you fall on the bed, but then your dreams are a little, you know, things are happening. We're all in this. We're all in this. This is spiritual war. That's what it is. Spiritual war. We were told that it would be this way. We were told that we would go into this. We were told that the, the signs of the end would be the increasing of wars, wars and rumors of war. But, you know, we always relegate that to, and it's like Russia and China. It's like rumors of war. What about war that's happening around you? Wars and rumors of war that swirls around you are on the increase. This is really good news, isn't it? You think, I don't want to hear this. You better hear it. You better hear it because they're... <laughs> There is victory in Jesus. We're going to get that. We're going to get there. Will this work yet? No. John 10.10. I want you to particularly look at the first part, you know, the first line. Oops, that's Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Okay, that's where I fouled up. Listen to the verse closely. The thief, John 10.10, the thief comes to what? Steal kill, and destroy. Now we know that Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. How many have abundant life? That doesn't mean, you know, I've got a full bank account and everything's really peachy, full gas tank and everything's one. It's not what it means. It's not talking about a prosperity issue. It's talking about life. Life. You cannot be destroyed when you have life in Jesus Christ, right? You, You have eternal life. And we haven't even scratched the surface to what that life looks like. Now, we know there's an increase here because this is what it is. The, the enemy has taken up war. Uh, just a kind of a list that we saw in a, in a short nutshell here is he's taken up war against the rule of God. All right? He's taken up war in the area between the fellowship of men and God. He's still doing that. He's trying to interrupt everything between the fellowship between men and God. That fellowship only happens for those believers in Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen for a Buddhist. It doesn't happen for a Muslim. It doesn't happen for any other religion. you got to be in Christ to have the attack against the fellowship. And so many of us are understanding and we realize and you realize that the fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ is, is being placed and is under attack by little things, little bitty things, like little bitty things. I'll not name any of them, but many little things. How many little things are in the room today? What are you talking about? No, you know what I'm talking about. This is the biggest distraction that has ever been brought to the planet. This is it right here. Whether it's an Android, goodness, or whether it's an iPhone, it's a, it's a distraction. I may find this to be true. Yeah, okay. It's a distraction. What is it distracting us from? Fellowship between us and God. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. The image of God in mankind has been under attack since the garden. The image of God. We've been made in the image of God. Every person born is made in the image of God. That's why you don't kill them in the womb. They're made in the image of God. doesn't matter how the 
the uh, conception took place, they're made in the image of God. And you punish the image of God in a little child for a rape or for an incest? You don't do that. Okay, I'm not talking politics. I'm talking ethics and morality before God. That is an attack of the enemy, and it's underway even now. The attack on the DNA of mankind. Did you know it's written into your DNA? Light is written into your DNA. I've mentioned this before, but light is written into your DNA. But that light is dim. That light is the image of God in you. But when you come to Jesus Christ, it's a known and shown thing that when someone believes in Jesus Christ, their DNA is more lit up than when you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. There's light in you. So we got to attack the DNA. We got to change the DNA so that there's no more light of God. And they're doing it. And they did it. And he's always doing it because the game plan is before us. Oh, pastor, you're just talking weird stuff. I'm talking Bible stuff. (laughs) <laughs> All right. The covenants of God are under attack. The covenant of God was under attack from the very beginning. And then every covenant that came along, whether it was God's promise in the Garden of Eden to bring someone who would crush this, the head of the seed of the serpent, or whether it would be the covenant that God made with Noah... You know, Noah is the one who's left over, he and his wife and their three kids... Right? There are three boys and the three wives are all that's left over. But my goodness, what's the first thing that happens when they come off the mountain and he plants a vineyard and gets drunk? We have, a, we have an attack on the family immediately to destroy the covenant. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but it was bad. It was very bad, very bad that happened. And there was a curse that was placed on Canaan as a result. Go read your Bible. Then comes Abraham, the new covenant. What are we going to destroy in Abraham? Well, he, she, Abraham and Sarah can't have Abraham and Sarah can't have kids. So what do we do? Well, let's give him another girl. This is my servant girl. Have a have a seed through her. And so Ishmael is born. What's been a plague on Israel ever since? What's been a plague on Isaac since that day? You see, because the enemy's trying to destroy covenants, he always tries to destroy covenants. We can walk all the way down through the covenants, all the way to the Son of the Living God. The, the enemy knew that the enemy knew that this was the, the Son of God. He just didn't know the plan. And so he's he's gonna do something here in his subtlety with the word of God. And he takes Jesus up after he's been fasting for 40 days. Man, I fast for like two meals, and my stomach thinks I've strangled myself. And so 40 days, he's he's fulfilled this 40-day period of time. And And uh, the enemy takes him, the Spirit of God actually takes him deep into the wilderness. The enemy there meets him and he's tempted of the devil. Scripture says so, tempted of the devil. And And he makes these three statements. If you will do this, then you'll get this. If you'll do this, you'll get this. If you do this, you'll get this. Jesus counters him with the word. What's he trying to do? He's trying to bring sin into the equation with Jesus Christ. So Jesus was tempted in every way that we are tempted. Yes, but was without sin. So he's trying to destroy. Okay, he didn't quite know the plan. We know that from 2 Corinthians. He didn't know the plan because if he would have known the plan, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. So they got rid of Jesus. They got rid of him, crucified Jesus. Why? Because we're going to destroy God's plan. But that was God's plan all along. (laughs) So who's smarter? Yeah, who's smarter? Now the attack is against the whole world and it's against the body of Christ, the assembly of the firstborn, the body of Christ. That be we. That's us. The church is under attack. The church is being drowned in immorality. The church is being drowned in false doctrine. The church is being drowned in sinister attacks against the very Word of God where much of the church of the world today do not believe that the Word of God is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, that it's only bits and pieces. And how do you find the bits and pieces? Well, it's whatever you feel. And now we're crashing into ruin. So he's going to attack in every angle. He's going to attack your faith. He's going to attack your family. He's going to attack you. Do you run away fleeing and panic and say, oh no, I don't know what I'm going to do. No, you do exactly what we read. You turn and you stand in the power of his might. 
and you put on the full armor of God, which we are not going to discuss today. We see the increase of it. This is the verse. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. Because lawlessness will abound. Now, Matthew chapter 24 is a chapter that describes predominantly what's going to happen to Israel from the time that Jesus is crucified all the way until the time that Israel is redeemed. There's coming a day, praise God, that Israel will be redeemed. Praise the Lord. But it's not going to happen until after seven years of what's called tribulation. They do not call on Messiah. They do not call on Jesus right now. They're expecting a Messiah to show up this very Passover. They're prophesying a Messiah is going to show up this very Passover. Some of you watch this stuff on YouTube. You say, man, there's so much junk on YouTube. There is a lot of junk. But there's also a lot to discover. There are red heifers. Red heifers have to be without spot, without blemish. But Leviticus tells us, God tells the Israelites in Leviticus, before you build a tabernacle or anoint the priest, you've got to take the red heifer and you've got to cook that thing. You've got to put him in a sacrificial mode and burn him up and then use the ashes to dedicate wherever the tabernacle or temple is going to be built. You use that red, you use that red heifer ashes to anoint the priest. So that's where the mark on the forehead came from. All right? It's not Ash Wednesday. That's a usurpation of the Word of God. It's not drawing the cross on the head. It's anointing with the ashes. Something has to burn before life comes to being. And so everything, sin, has to be dealt with, and it was the red heifer that did it. Well, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they've been trying to come up with red heifers so they could rededicate a new temple. They haven't been able to do it for, I think it's, not, uh, it's now 1,600 years. They haven't been able to do it. More than that, it's 2,600 years. Probably off on my number. Don't worry about the number. It's since before Christ that they had a red heifer that they could actually do it. You know they have four now? They're actually planning on doing it on March 30th. Sacrificing a red heifer. Now that temple that they want to make and put up is not God's temple. It's going to be their temple to restart the sacrificial system. Jesus paid for the sacrifices. Everything they're doing is going to be an abomination to the Lord and none of it's going to work. I say all that to say this. It's going to be a seven-year period of tribulation upon the whole world where God is going to judge the nations of the world. This is in the Scripture. This is all over the Scripture. It's called the Day of the Lord. And he's going to judge the whole world. His wrath is going to be poured out on the world. The Jews are going to suffer more than they ever suffered, ever, ever, ever. Worse than the Holocaust. No day like it before, nor any day again like it. It's going to be horrible. But the end result is, one third of Israel is going to call out and they're going to say, the words that he has said, they're going to recognize Jesus. They're going to mourn for him. Zechariah chapter 14. They're going to mourn for, the, for him, for the one that they pierced. And they're going to cry out, Baruch Hababa Shem Adonai, which is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, recognizing Jesus as Messiah. And at that point, Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Now here's the key. you got to understand. you got to understand there is a host of heaven wearing white robes made spotless and clean that are riding with him. Does anybody know who that is? Look at your neighbor. But I can't ride a horse. You're going to have seven years in heaven to learn. All right? Wow, I just gave you an entire timeline. Matthew chapter 24 says that as that day approaches, the signs are going to be the love of most is going to grow cold. Are you seeing it? Are you experiencing it? We're going to see an increase in wars and rumors of war. That's been that way since Jesus died on the cross, by the way. But it's going to go off the charts. It is off the charts. We see the increase of confused and chaotic thinking all around the world. They're so, it's so chaotic. You can't make sense of anything they're thinking. How can you think that way? Scripture says it. When you give up the worship of the 
creator for the created thing, and you begin to worship idols and, and, and practice idolatry, the scripture says that you are going to be given over to a reprobate mind. Now that word reprobate means confused and chaotic thinking. You exchange the proper affections of a man for a woman so that a man is affected after a man. And the woman gives up the natural affections for men to have unnatural affections for women. And then it really goes south when you have what Jesus said, the days of Noah and the days of Lot. The days of Noah, the normalcy was weirdness, sin, violence, and the changing of the DNA. And the days of Lot was a total giving over to everything that's abnormal. And it's chaotic thinking. They, can, they actually believe it's right and it's okay. They have given up to believe that that which was you, that used to be called good is now bad. And that which used to be called bad is now good. Are you following me? I, I give all this. I know you know this to be true, but I give it all so that you're, you're reminded that the scripture told us it would be this way. There would be an increase of ethnic hatred. <clears throat> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. It's off the charts. We see the increase in violence and hatred and assault and disregard for people. Disregard for creation. Disregard for everything but themselves. We see it everywhere. Please don't let it creep into your own life. We can literally see in the flood just before the flood happened, that animalistic behavior was the norm. That's why God not only destroyed humanity, He destroyed animals, because genetic hybridization went all the way down to the animals. But God took the pure and saved it. Praise God. God took the righteous and saved it. Doesn't mean Noah was perfect in no sin. It means He was perfect in all His generations. He was unblemished, meaning He was not hybridized. And God spared the human race. Is God not good? Oh, it was such a terrible thing for God to do to destroy the world. No, the world destroyed itself. God had to judge it or there would no longer be a human race. I know you've probably thought it and you might have even said it. Something like this. As you look at the world and you see what's happening, you would have said or have said or have thought something like this. It's like demons have been unleashed on the human race. Has anybody ever, have anybody thought, I got to know, am I, am I thinking like you're thinking? You have me say, man, it's like demons have been unleashed. How many have thought that? How many have actually said it? Oh, I don't want to confess anything negative. No, 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 no you're not going to change anything by, by saying it. It's true. It's true. It's true. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Well, we'll get there. Hold your horses. Jesus said that the world would be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot before the Lord came were there. The Apostle John witnessed, this in, it witnessed it in a sequence of events that was demonstrated in what the Bible calls the Maseroth, that the enemy has... Uh, he's counterfeited in something called astrology. We do not believe in astrology. Don't follow after astrology, but there is a thing called the Maseroth. The Maseroth is 12 constellations that God created. The 12 constellations in order that go by every year. The sun is in all of them all year. It goes through all of them and tells you the story. And it's actually the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. The 12 constellations tell that story. Oh, but no, we've got to have this and that so your day will be better today. Oh, don't do that because your day in the constellations. That is garbage. That distracts from the truth of Scripture. Poor Job is suffering and God says, did you make the Maseroth? That's what he says. The Maseroth are the constellations. It's a Jewish word. Did you make the Pleiades? Did you make Orion in his place? Who do you think you are? That's God to Job, by the way, because he was complaining because he was suffering. We always complain when we suffer, don't we? 
The enemy has poisoned everything. The enemy has counterfeited everything from the beginning, and that's the war. It's always deception. It's always destruction. It's always deception. It's always destruction. And, and beyond that, it's always deception, and it's always destruction. Do you get it? So I'm going to have a definition in terms here. Oh, did that work or did you do it? Oh. You know, there's always hope. We're going to read a portion of Revelation chapter 12 because I told you it was on the increase. You agreed that it's on the increase. There's a reason that it's on the increase. So we have to define terms. Revelation chapter 12 is, I mean, right in the middle. And it is a, a literal thing that's happening, but it has figurative terms. Okay, it's literal, but it's spoken figuratively. Right? And, and, and it's not allegorical. It's actual terms. It's literal, but with terminology that is explained within the chapter. I'm going to do it beforehand. We're going to see a woman. The woman is the constellation that they call today Virgo, but it's actually the constellation of the Virgin. Virgo is Latin for the Virgin. That's a, it's, it's actually the constellation. In that constellation... It, is uh, the sun, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N, is, is she's clothed in the sun, so the sun's behind her. You can't actually see her. She's clothed in the sun. So if you were to look up and see Virgo at the right time of the year, Virgo's there, but you can't see her because she's clothed in the sun. How many can look at the sun and see a constellation? And you can't see it. You see stars. <laughs> not literally. But She's clothed in the sun, and the moon is at her feet, and there's 12 stars over her head. Now, that's, a, that's two constellations. One is Leo, and the other is Virgo. All right, that's there, and it's in this chapter. Then there's going to be a male child. The male child was always thought to be Jesus Christ, but it's not Jesus Christ because John said that everything after chapter 4 has yet to take place. Now, Jesus died. Jesus died on the cross at least at least 50 years earlier than this was written and probably 60 years earlier than this was written. In chapter four, he starts out, I'm going to show you the things which have yet to take place. That includes chapter 12. So there's a sign in the heavens we're going to read. There's a, there's a, ch a child there, a man child. That represents the body of Christ. All right, where's Jesus? Well, he's the head of the body, isn't he? Where's he? Come on, come on, you know your word. He's at the right hand of the Father. Where's his body? Now, don't get the picture of a headless body. You know, there's a head up there. No, it, it's metaphorical in terminology. He's the head. He controls the body. He is the ruler of the body. Where is he? Right hand of the Father. Where's the body of Christ? Still on the earth. The two need to be brought together. That's going to be the picture you're going to see. Number three, the fiery red dragon represents, and the scripture's going to say so in chapter 12, the fiery red dragon is Satan, the devil, the serpent, the accuser, the deceiver, the destroyer, whatever you want to call him. But chapter 12 is going to define that. Are you with me? Third, the stars of heaven, from the Old Testament, the stars are heav of heaven are a, a figurative term to mean the angels. So when the wise men saw a star in the heavens, they were looking at the constellations. The constellations spoke of the birth of the king of the Jews. They knew it, where it would be because a few hundred years earlier, the Jews had lived amongst them in Persia. Huh. There was going to be a king of the Jews. So they knew the sign, they saw the sign, and they headed out. It took them a couple of years to get there to find the king of the Jews. But when they find Herod, and Herod said, where is the king of the Jews? Herod said, I don't know, tell me. And he tells his scholars, where's the king of the Jews to be born? They say, it's going to be in Bethlehem. Oh, let's kill all the kids. So the wise men head toward Bethlehem, but then the star led them. I'm telling you, a star cannot lead you from a constellation. A star led them to directly the house and stood over the house. So what star is that? I just told you. <laughs> An angel. Because in the Old Testament, the angels were, were figuratively, figuratively called stars. 
the stars of heaven. Now, that doesn't mean when you look up at night, there's like the star Algernon. No, that's a star. That's a physical thing up there, but they are, they are uh, things of light at nighttime. Well, s- angels are, are beings of light. So you see the correlation. Is everybody with me? So now we've de- we, de- we have determined, we have defined the terms. So, and that didn't work, so Derek's going to have to do it. We're going to go to chapter 12 of the book of the Revelation. What is the point? The point is to show you what has taken place and why it's intensifying. Here we go. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. Now, this is the Maserat. This is the sky. This is the stars at night. Follow? A great sign appeared. From John's vantage point, this is yet to come. But in the end, this sign would appear in the sky. And it did. It has already appeared. We watched it. You say, well, I didn't know anything about it. In, in all grace, as much as I can possibly say it, you have not been taught the prophetic word. You have been taught how to live right. For the most part. You have been, not been taught that the only way you should be living right now is fully, fully blown up in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that he's coming back. That sign actually happened on September 23rd, 2017. If you go back in your history, you will notice that from about 2017 onward, things have gone to hell in a handbasket. Just saying. Here's the sign. A woman, that's Virgo, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now, the 12, there are the constellation Leo is right above her head. So in the circle, Leo is right above her head. Leo has nine stars in it. So where's the 12 come from? Well, on September 23rd, 2017, three wandering stars came into Leo. Huh. Three. They were Mars, Mercury, and Venus came into Leo on that exact day at that exact moment, which our time was roughly noon, which you couldn't see it. But we have technology. God said to Daniel, Daniel, when are these things going to happen? Daniel's wanting to know. God says, it's not for you to know, but there's coming a day where knowledge will increase. Then they're going to know. Boom. Did you get that? Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. On that sign, Jupiter, which is the sign of the man child, it's actually, that's what they call it. Now, Jupiter is a Latin term, Greek term, Latin term for their God, Jupiter. So that's not the name of the planet, okay? But that planet represents, it represents the body of Christ. Okay, so being with child, for nine months prior to September 23rd, Jupiter went into the womb of the constellation and stayed there in retrograde, retrograde motion for set 47 weeks. How long is the gestation period for a little baby? 47 tumultuous weeks. And on September 23rd, Jupiter exited the constellation Virgo Graphically speaking, right between her legs. Are you following me? Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail threw a third of the stars of heaven. Stars are who? How many angels follow Lucifer? Okay, now you're with me. And we read that from Ezekiel chapter 14 last week. His tail drew a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. Okay, who threw them to the earth? Did God? No, Lucifer, the dragon, threw them to the earth. So that would happen sometime after the September 23rd, 2017 sign. 
Did you follow? Okay, so now they've been thrown to the earth and the dragon himself is standing before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour the child as soon as it's born. Who's the child? Us. Why does he want to devour us? Because we're the body of Christ. You kill the body of Christ, you devour the body of Christ, what's left? This is his thinking, right? But is God going to allow that to happen? No, because he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That doesn't mean the church won't be affected. It has been affected. So she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Oh, that's Jesus. No, it's not. Book of the Revelation to the church in Thyatira says, if you will repent and overcome, you will be given the place to rule the nations with a rod of iron. With Jesus. Why? Because he's the head and we're the body. Her child was caught up to God. Say that with me. Caught up. You got to say it like me. Caught up, man. Wow. Now I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to show you something. The caught up here is the word, and I've talked about it before, it's the word harpazo. It's Greek. It means to be violently snatched out. It means to be taken quickly and swiftly and caught up where? To heaven. Was Jesus violently snatched away? Of course you say, no, he was not. How did he go? Slowly. The word that is used here is the word harpazo, which is the same word used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, which says, which says, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be harpazo, caught up, snatched away, violently snatched up to heaven, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. For us, that's redemption day. Hallelujah. Okay, that's harpazo. But when Jesus rose... When Jesus rose, Acts chapter 1, he's there, and they're all standing, and they're looking at him, and they're watching him go up, is the word aperthe. Aperthe, aperthe means to rise gently and to be exalted. Was Jesus about to be devoured by the enemy? Nuh-uh. He gave himself freely on the cross. There's no devouring of Jesus by the enemy. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. So this is a last day event. What is it preceded by? It is preceded by. This event, we call affectionately the rapture of the church. Oh, it's not in the Bible, they say. Yes, it is. It's Latin. It comes from the Latin for the term harpazo, translated into rapiamer. In street Latin, it's raptos. In raptos, in English, becomes rapture. So we say rapture. Isn't that a cool word? I want to get raptured. What precedes that? The dragon taking his third of the angels and casting them on the earth. Why are we seeing an increase of evil and wickedness, and bizarre, and the changing of DNA, hybridization, AI. If this goes on, they've already said by the year 2029, AI, artificial intelligence, will be, will be more intelligent than the whole of all humanity. This cannot go on. This cannot go on. The sign is that the enemy has cast his minions to the earth. They're not demons. They are fallen angels. They are fallen angels. You say, well, okay, what are you trying to say there, Mr. Pastor Jimmy? You've gone off the deep end. I fully admit it, I'm off the deep end. The fallen angel host has been sent by the God of this world, not our God, but the God of this world to the earth to deceive and destroy on steroids. What's that mean? <laughs> it means like never before. I'm not going to read the rest of this, but it goes on to say he will be relegated himself to the earth and he's going to be ticked off 
The reason is he is actually going to storm heaven and attack heaven. But he will be defeated. In his hubris, in his pride, he's going to attack heaven. <laughs> oh my goodness. And he's going to be pitched to the earth and he's going to walk the earth as a man. He's going to be relegated to the earth. Heaven's going to rejoice and say, oh, ho, ho, the one he's cast out. The one who had to report every so often is cast out. He'd never be up here again. Oh, hallelujah. And there's a great praise. But woe to the earth. For that great dragon is cast down to you, that devil of old, the serpent of old, the devil, the accuser of the brethren is cast down to you and he is filled with wrath because he knows his time is short, meaning his time is about up. Okay, what does that tell us? It tells us that we are even now seeing the casting down of the third. I truly believe we have seen the influx of spiritual warfare caused by the fact that the gods, the ancient gods, they're all false, but the ancient gods have returned. And I'm not the only one. There are many. You can, you can listen to Jonathan Kahn and others if you've heard of these names. And you will all hear, you'll hear the same thing. They're all saying it. They're writing books on it. The gods have returned. Why? Because the the, the fallen angels have been cast to the earth by the chief, by their chief fallen angel, Lucifer. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 says this, and do this knowing that the time, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Okay, Pastor Jim, he's talking to the Romans. Yes, he is, but he's also speaking prophetically to us. The last generation, I think everyone in the room would agree, we're in the last generation because of the signs that have already been fulfilled, the coming of Israel back into the nation, to being a nation that started in 1948. Their war was completed in 1949. However, which way you look at it, it's about over. The last generation is reaching its end. I, I, you can argue this with me and I will, whip, I will win every time if you have a heart to know and understand. And I think you all do. Meaning what Paul is saying, it's high time to waken out of sleep because our salvation, praise God, our salvation. So here's the hope. Our salvation is nearer than when we believed. But not just for that, it's for now. It's for now. We have hope. Because of our salvation in Jesus Christ. So all that bad news is about to take us into the best news. Are you ready for the best news? Because the bad news is really, really bad. But the good news is mega good. It's mega good. Okay, so we're going back to Ephesians chapter 6. And I want you to see this. I've got three portions of this underlined. Here's the first one. Finally. Oh man, how many say finally? Yeah, you've all said it. Dinner's late. Finally, right? That word finally is the word loipon. You don't have to remember this, but loipon means the time remaining. In other words, in the remaining days. That's what it means. So if you looked at this with the word meaning, it is finally, finally, my brethren. So in these last few days, this is what he's saying. In whatever time remains, brethren, be strong in the Lord. Would you run back? Because he had to exit. Can you run back there and hit the next slide? Or will it work? Now, you know, I never give up hope. The next portion of this is be strong in the Lord. I want, it, I want the slide so that you'll see it's underlined. That's all. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So there are three words here. First of all, be strong is the word endunamis. Endunamis means to be empowered. We know that, right? To be empowered with His strength. There He's coming back. And then secondly is in, not only His strength, but in His power, which is the word kratos. I'll explain these. And then thirdly, in His might, which is the word iskus. Oh, man, other languages, they're just so hard to know. What it means is you will be increased in his vigorous strength and his power, right? So be 
vigorously increased in his strength. The word kratos means dominion or the dominion of his rule. So that is the word that is, is, that is say, uh, used right here and it translated power. So in the dominion of his rule and then might there at the end is actually can be translated all powerful mightiness. Can I just give you this verse now amplified? It is, it is now be strengthened with the vigorous increase of his mighty strength and be strong in his dominion and rule, not yours, not the world, but his dominion and his rule, and be filled with that power and that might in all his all-powerful mightiness. Who wins? Oh, man, I'm just ready to fight right now. Yes, life can be hard. Yes, he throws stuff at us. And yes, we have, we have casualties and we get wounded and things happen and our heart breaks for different reasons and all of this takes place and there's death and there's pain and there's suffering. But all of it should lead us to be strengthened with his vigorous might and his power under the dominion of his rule, knowing that he is all powerful and we can have and stand in his mightiness. And in him, in him, we can stand. That word stand is the word stenai. It sounds like a cool word, but it actually means to be in balance. It's all right. You're, you're coming to stand. It's a stand of a soldier. It's a stand of a fight. I was a wrestler. You don't walk out to the middle of the mat and go, hey, buddy, how are you doing? Let's wrestle. You know what's going to happen to you? you're on your back. You're looking up and, and what we used to say, you're counting the lights in the gymnasium because you're looking up saying, okay, there's lights over there. All right, I'm stuck. You lose the match, right? Now picture that as being a soldier in a war. A soldier just doesn't walk out and say, let's fight, man. <laughs> right? Are you being silly, Pastor Jim? Well, you gotta be a little silly. It is actually planting your foot and saying, let's go at it. Balance. You can't knock me over. When I'm ready, you can't knock me over. That's what this word means. Stand. You can't knock me over. I'm a block, man. You can't knock me over. You can push me. You can knock me around, but you can't knock me over because I'm balanced. I'm balanced. I'm standing in his might. How is the devil going to knock God over? The devil in his pride is going to attack heaven. What's going to happen? God is... God and Lucifer is not and neither are you who are you going to choose to stand in John 4 4 we ended last week with that verse for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world but we're going to end with the verse we started with today. And you find that, Derek, it's Philippians 2, 9 through 11. And read it out loud with me again, because this is our declaration. I know you've got trouble. I know you've got pain. I know you're in fights. I know you are. You're in spiritual warfare. You're in spiritual battles. We all are. I know it comes in different shapes and forms. But this verse works overall. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Stop. This equates to 1 Peter chapter 5 or 4, uh, 5 and James chapter 4. Both of them say basically the same thing. Submit yourself to God. And resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Peter says it this way. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, submitting to him, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse variation, because they're two different writers, but it's very, very powerful to understand that in the name of Jesus, whatever attacking you is going to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And that which is attacking this world right now and seemingly winning all the victories that can be won 
is going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, not in submission of surrender, but in submission of acknowledgement. I'm a had dad. I'm, I'm done. It's over. He is God. I'm not. And a high dive into the lake of fire is what's going to follow. Now listen, you start standing in the power of his mighty vigorousness. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw that in chapter four of Ephesians be, or five. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Leave the stuff of this world behind and follow after Jesus Christ. You're already part of the victor team. Fight, fight, fight. I know this will drive somebody crazy, but the new football coach at Nebraska gave a speech before a game, and he was fired up. And here's what he said. And I, and I listened to that, and I got all fired up and wanted to play football. But this is for war. And he's speaking to a bunch of guys that for the last several years have played football and played hard and lost games by three points, four points, they, they're winning the games until the end and they think, oh no, something's gonna happen and we're gonna lose the game. And so that's a losing attitude. It's, a, it's, a, it's an infection that infected the whole team. And he's going out and he's telling his players, you got to give it 100%. And here's what he said, if we die, we die. Okay, they're playing football, all right? The point is this. This is the place, this is where we choose. We are gonna fight. We're not gonna ever give up. We're gonna stand. If we die, we die. If there was ever a word for the church of Jesus Christ today, it is, I'm taking my stand right here. I'm not letting up. I'm following Jesus. They can call me names. They can throw their rocks. They can even hurt me if they want to. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words sometimes crush me. But I'm making my stand. If we die, we die. Why? Why can we say that? Because Jesus made the promise. Anyone who believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And anyone who lives in me will never die. One is dying in Christ and the other is being alive when he comes back and they both rise. Stand up. We got we to gotta fight, man. The, the biggest fight happens, the biggest fight has to happen. The biggest, the biggest stand against the enemy has to happen at your lowest point. It can't be when you're on the mountaintop, because then it's more like, bah. everything's under my feet, man, in Jesus' name. The enemy's under my feet. Everything's going good. No, no. You're about to go down into the valley. I guarantee when you get to the mountaintop, you might rest there and look around and say, man, Mount Everest, it's wonderful up here. I see everything. But there's not much oxygen up there. You're going to have to go down. And it's on the going down and finding the valley that you're going to find the Goliaths. It's the valley that you're going to find the giant. It's the valley you're going to find the war. And that's where you're going to have to make your stand and fight. And some of you are in that valley right now. Now's the time to make your stand and fight. It's not you. It's not your strength. It's him. It's not this thing coming at you. It is, it is the devil himself. So you got to stand against him by standing in Jesus Christ. So will you make your stand with me right now? Come on, tell me, are you? No, pastor, I'm not going to stand. Okay, good. Nobody would say that. I know nobody would say that. But I want you to be excited about the fact that you serve the victor. God has highly exalted him. Is that future tense or is that past tense? It's already happened. That's who you serve. That's who you serve. Let's pray. Now take your, take your battle to the Lord right now. Don't come at him whining and saying, I don't want the battle to end. No, say, Lord, I want to be strengthened in the battle to win through you. So don't pray for the, for the escaping of the battle, but pray right now for the victory in the battle 
through Jesus Christ. Father, we are, we are so humbled to know again and see again that we do not have the tools, we do not have the strength, we do not have, have the wherewithal, we do not have anything necessary to battle and fight the enemy in our own. We have nothing. We have nothing. Just like we have nothing to offer you when we come to you for salvation, we have nothing that will stand against the enemy. The only thing that we have and the best thing that we have is we are tucked into you as we have seen every step of the way in the study in Ephesians. We are in Christ. We are in you. We are in you. We are in you. You are the victor. And there is a day coming of rest. There is a day coming. The Sabbath rest of God is coming for us. But until we get there, if we die, we die. But we're going to fight. We're going to fight. And not fall to the wiles and the tricks and the nastiness of the enemy. We're not going to allow the words that are brought our way or the attacks that are come against that have come against us to tear us down and, and make us depressed. We're going to look to Jesus Christ and be invigorized. I know it's not a word, Lord, but we're going to be we're going to be given the vigor of your mightiness. Through the Holy Spirit, baptize us, fill us again with your spirit. So that we can stand against the enemy for our families and for our marriages and for our church and for, for, for what you have called us to do. We're going to stand knowing that we already are in the one who has been highly exalted. And the enemy is going to have to bow the knee. We bow the knee right now and say, Lord, in you, in you, in you, I can do all things. I can do all things. That means I can fight this battle through you and in you and in your name. I can win through you, in you, even if that winning doesn't happen all the way until the trumpet sounds and we're taken out of here. We're going to stand. We're going to stand in balance. We're going to stand fully armored. We're going to stand ready to go. We're going to stand with the love of Jesus Christ beaming out of our eyes and the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. God help us. And God help anyone today who chooses to try to do this without standing in you. Because the devil's going to chew them up and spit them out. But we say, with the help of the Holy Spirit, not us. Not me. Not in pride do we say this. We say, it's in Christ. In your name. And with that, I'm going to say, everybody says, amen, amen. amen. All right, now go do it.